Today we're going to be talking about protozoa, the intestinal amoeba. Some general information about protozoa. They are single-celled animals. Most species are free-living. Now some protozoa have structures for propulsion and other types of movement. For example, pseudopods, flagella, and cilia. Many multiply by binary fission. Some use sexual and asexual reproduction. Most have two stages, while some have a single stage. And the stages are known as this, the trophozoite stage. This is the motile, reproducing, feeding, and infective stage. And it's typically in an irregular type shape. Then there's the cyst stage, which is the non-motile, non-feeding, infective stage. It's dormant and it's typically round. This next diagram just gives you a demonstration of the trophozoite, how it insists to become a cyst, it's passed in the feces, and it's excist. And that's uh, what you typically see with the intestinal amoeba that we're talking about today. Now the first one I like to talk about is Entamoeba histolytica slash dispar. And this is two separate species of parasite that are very difficult to differentiate. Now all of these amoeba we're going to be talking about today have a cosmopolitan distribution. They're all contracted via the ingestion of contaminated food and water. But only one is a true pathogen and that's Entamoeba histolytica. And you can identify that microscopically by seeing ingested red blood cells within a trophozoite. Uh, Entamoeba histolytica is associated with both intestinal and extra-intestinal infections. Now, Entamoeba dispar, which is a non-pathogen, is morphologically identical to E. histolytica. The pathology of E. histolytica is known as amoebiasis, which is amoebic dysentery, and you may see flask-shaped ulcers of the colon. If the amoeba leave the intestinal tract, we call that extra-intestinal amoebiasis. And this is very a very serious infection, and it, and it can go to the brain, the liver, the skin, and the lungs. This is the life cycle for Entamoeba histolytica, and other than the fact it has parts for extra-intestinal disease, this life cycle is the same for all the amoeba we'll be talking about today. Let's talk about the internal structures for Entamoeba histolytica. The nucleus. You're going to have a small central karyosome and a fine, even peripheral chromatin. Chromatoid bodies are going to be with rounded ends and it's frequently called cigar shaped. Cysts will have between one and four nuclei, a mature cyst having four. The cysts usually measure about 12 to 15 microns. The trophozoite is only going to have one nucleus, usually measuring about 15 to 20 microns, but it can have a much wider range. If you do see the ingestion of red blood cells, this can be used to differentiate E. histolytica from E. dispar. The trophozoites of E. histolytica have a progressive motility. And in these pictures you can see the E. histolytica, E. dispar cyst, arrows pointing at the nuclei and the chromatoid bars. But based on what we see in this picture, you cannot differentiate the two. And here we have the E. histolytica, E. dispar trophs. Again, a single nucleus. Again, you cannot differentiate between the two species. However, when you get to these photographs, you can, because you can see the ingested RBCs within these trophozoites. So this is Entamoeba histolytica. And something that you may see with Entamoeba histolytica when you're examining a uh, stool prep is something called a charcoal-laden crystal. And you can see that on the right, those are those elongated diamond-shaped uh, crystals that could be found in the stool. And these are the breakdown products of eosinophils. They are slender and pointed at both ends, uh, normally colorless, but they will stain red when you're dealing with 
a trichrome stain. Let's talk about the commensals real quick. Just some general information. There's a handful of them. Entamoeba coli, Entamoeba hartmanni, Entamoeba polecki, Endolimax nana, and Iotamoeba bushlii. They're all non-pathogenic, and they all reside in the large intestine of the human host. If they're non-pathogenic, why do we care? Because for a person to have this, they had to ingest tainted water or food. So though these are non-pathogenic, the potential for having a pathogen somewhere in the stool still exists. So that's why we still report it out. Now both the cysts and the trophozoites of these species are passed in stool and considered diagnostic. Entamoeba coli, the cyst stage. Now this is the largest intestinal amoeba. Usually it's spherical, but may be elongated, measuring 10 to 35 microns. Mature cysts typically have eight nuclei, but they may be hypernucleated and they can have up to 16 or more. Entamoeba coli is the only species in the genus that you're gonna see more than four nuclei in the cyst stage. Looking at the more internal structures of the nucleus, you typically have a large, smudgy, eccentric karyosome with a coarse, irregular peripheral chromatin. If chromatoid bodies are seen, they are gonna appear splinter-like with pointed ends. Now the chromatoid bodies are seen less frequently than in ehistolytica. Now in these photographs we can see cyst stage of entamoeba coli and you can see that there's more than four nuclei in each one of these photographs. Now the trophozoite of E. coli is very large, uh, usually measuring in a large range of about 15 to 50 microns. They will have a single nucleus with a large eccentric karyosome, a coarse irregular peripheral chromatin, and the cytoplasm is usually coarsely granular and vacuolated, often described as a dirty cytoplasm. Motility is different from Entamoeba histolytica in the fact that the motility of Entamoeba coli is considered sluggish and non-directional, and it'll have short, blunt pseudopods. And here's a couple photographs of Entamoeba coli trophozoites. Entamoeba hartmanni, the cyst, very, very similar to E. histolytica. However, they're smaller, measuring from about 5 to 10 microns. You can differentiate E. histolytica from E. hartmanni based on the size. And if it's less than 10 microns, you're probably dealing with Entamoeba hartmanni. Now the trophozoites of Entamoeba hartmanni usually measure about five to 15 microns. These trophozoites possess a single nucleus that contains a small, compact, centrally or eccentrically located karyosome and a fine, uniform peripheral chromatin. The cytoplasm is finely granular Movement in the living trophozoites is described as non-progressive. Entamoeba polecki. The cyst of Entamoeba polecki measure about 9 to 25 microns. They are usually unanucleate, but binucleate forms are rarely seen. The nucleus is large, measuring up to about one-third of the diameter of the cyst. The karyosome is pleomorphic, and may be minute to large and compact to diffuse and centrally to eccentrally located. Peripheral chromatin is light to heavy but is usually evenly distributed. Cysts also contain an inclusion mass of variable size and numerous chromatoid bodies, which may be small and round to large rods with round and splintered ends. So basically, Entamoeba polecki runs the whole gamut of different morphologies. The trophozoite stage is often rounded, measuring 10 to 25 microns. It has a single nucleus that is often distorted and irregularly shaped 
with a small to minute centrally located karyosome. Peripheral chromatin is usually delicate and uniform. The cytoplasm is often vacuolated with a hyaline border. Blunt pseudopods may be seen. Endolimax nanocyst. The cysts are spherical in shape and hence the name nana. They are small and they measure about 5 to 10 microns. Now the mature cysts possess four nuclei with large blot-like karyosomes that are lacking a peripheral chromatin. Now the endolimax nanotrophozoites they have a single nucleus with a characteristic large, irregularly shaped blot-like karyosome. The nucleus has no peripheral chromatin. The cytoplasm is granular and often highly vacuolated. e can be difficult to distinguish from those of Iodamoeba bushleyi, the parasite we'll be talking about next. Iodamoeba bushleyi. The cysts are spherical and measure about 5 to 20 microns. It has a single nucleus containing a large, usually eccentric karyosome. Key characteristic, a large compact mass of glycogen or a glycogen vacuole. In an unstained wet mount, it's still visible. In an iodine stain preparation, it takes on a darker reddish brown color. The glycogen vacuole does not stain with a trichrome stain. And here on the left hand side you can see the cyst in an unstained wet mount and you can clearly see the glycogen vacuole. On the right hand side we have another Iodamoeba bushleyi cyst in a trichrome stain and you can see how the glycogen vacuole does not stain at all. Trophozoites, about 8 to 20 microns. They have a single nucleus with a large, usually central karyosome surrounded by refractile achromatic granules. The cytoplasm is coarsely granular and vacuolated. And on this last slide, it just gives you a little bit more detail on what you're looking for when you're trying to distinguish them based on the nucleus, right? So we have Entamoeba histolytica in the upper left-hand corner, central karyosome, even peripheral chromatin, next to it, Entamoeba hartmanni, looks the same as Entamoeba histolytica, but smaller. Next to that, Entamoeba coli, eccentric karyosome and an irregular peripheral chromatin. In the bottom left-hand corner, we have Endolimax nana, which is the large blot-like karyosome lacking any peripheral chromatin. And on the bottom right-hand side is karyosome for Iodamoeba bushleyi, also a large karyosome.